I hope from last week, I'm using Galatians as the introduction for Romans. So what I want to do tonight is go more specifically into Paul's letter to the Galatians. However, as I was going over this stuff last night, I thought I, it's probably going to be helpful if I hit a couple of, of items before we get into it, uh, because they will prove very significant by about the middle of my talk this evening. So rather than stop and do it then, I think I want to remind us of this now. So Paul uses a term uh, frequently that in English is ambiguous, and it's also ambiguous in the original Greek, and that is righteousness or justification. Now, since the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Lutherans under Martin Luther had really clinged, clung to this word, and somewhat, of course I'm biased, but somewhat distorted what Paul meant by that in the first century to apply to his fight in the 16th century. So while Martin Luther is fighting against the acts of piety and devotionalism of Roman Catholicism, Paul is talking about acts of obedience to Torah. But Martin Luther kind of slides this in there in his arguments and makes it look as though Paul is condemning public expressions of cultic kinds of behavior. And he's saying uh, going to church, plenary indulgences, um, those cannot make you righteous or justify you before God, as Paul said. But of course, Paul is not talking about the Roman Catholic Church at the end of the Middle Ages. It's a, a difficult term, but it's one we have to grapple with before we can talk about Galatians and Romans. So what does Paul mean by this Greek term, diakosune, or righteousness, or to be made righteous, or the verb to justify. It's all from the same single Greek word. It has in it, the Greek word has in it, justice. This dikaios is, is a Greek root for the word justice or law abiding. But I think the best way to think of it is, let's say I borrowed money from you 10 years ago. I needed money to pay off my car. I swear to you, I promise to God, I'll pay it back in 11 months. I just need... Ten years later, I still haven't done it. And every time I see you, I say, oh, God, there she is. It's so embarrassing and awkward. But I finally get the money. I was playing the lottery. And, yeah. <laughs> and I can pay it off and add interest and feel good about the fact that I have made this right. That is what Paul is after with this word, to be justified, to be righteous. With you now, I can, I am righteous. We have, I have made this good. What I have done what was wrong, I have now made it right, correctly, properly, at an interest so that it's truly not just what I borrowed 10 years ago, but what that money is now worth. You're happy with the outcome finally. I'm happy with the outcome. And I can relax every time I see you in church on Sunday now, right? That's what this means. Paul, as a Pharisaic Jew, was brought up to think in his traditions that I attained this kind of relationship with God by obeying the 613 or 636, depending on how the rabbis counted, 613 rules of Torah. The, observation, the observances of Torah that require me to avoid pork, that require me to avoid eating meat from an animal that has been strangled, that require me to obey the taboos regarding ritual impurity. The Pharisaic tradition was that this made you righteous before God. If you did these, obeyed these rules, then you would be in right relationship with God. Paul, as a Pharisee, grew up believing this, but because of his encounter, his mystical encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, he says he has suddenly realized 
that the Torah and its observance cannot make you righteous with God. Now that Christ has come, that he has died and risen from the dead, in him we are made righteous before God. Not by doing X, Y, or Z rules of Torah. It's an important and a fundamental concept because you have to imagine if, if you're Tony Macaronius, some pagan living in Rome or living in Corinth, you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile pagan, and Paul comes along and tells you there is only one God, not many gods, and you can be made right with this God if you accept and believe in Jesus Christ. You go, who, who is Jesus Christ? And you find out, oh, he was a capital criminal of the Roman Empire, executed legally under the law, and you're going to tell me, what? And when was that? Oh, that was 30 years ago? Really? And where did that happen? Oh, it was off in Jerusalem. What the heck does that have to do with me? It's a reasonable question, especially of a non-Jew, to ask of Paul when he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that event, how does that affect me in any way at all? This is the unique contribution of Paul to our understanding of our salvation in Christ. So to get at this, I'm going to have to go through, repeat what we did last, last time I was here before, and talk about what he understands as being in Christ. And how do you get in Christ? You get in Christ by your baptism. So let me review the primitive rite of the earliest notion of Christian baptism. It is not having three little drops of water poured over your head over a bucket or a font. The word baptizo means to be plunged down into the water completely, over your head into water. It's the same word, I've used the same example, washing a baked potato, you plunge it down in the water in the bowl and scrub it, you, you use it for dyeing cloth, and so all that stuff about down and completely immersed in. So in that ritual, the three times, remember, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in those each times you're pushed down, you're unsure of, is this idiot going to let me back up again? And when he does, it's in the name of the Father and of the Son. That, in that ritual, you have mystically died with Christ. Three times you have risked death. It is really a death-defying act in Paul's understanding. That in being immersed underwater three times and being brought up out of that three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you have died with Christ, thereby binding yourself to that which Christ achieved when he died on Calvary and rose from the dead. That which Christ got by his death and resurrection, knew you now get because you have died with him. After your baptism, you were clothed in a white toga-like cloth, more of a tunic like this, tunic-like cloth. Put on Christ. You are now inside, in Christ. That is how you benefit from what Jesus did on Calvary 30 years ago, far away in Jerusalem. It is this baptism into his death that joins you to Christ, and that union with Christ in his death and resurrection justifies you with God, not acts of the law. Does that, does that make sense? So, I am made just, right, righteous with God by joining to his death and resurrection in my baptism. How do I present myself for baptism by faith. What prepares me for baptism is my faith in what Paul just preached to me as the gospel. Paul evangelizes in Corinth, in Galatia. I hear him and I believe it. 
ah, now I have faith. Now I can justifiably be baptized. And Why do you believe? This is a big. I've been wondering about this, this for is a, years. A Why magical, do you believe what this guy says? This is kind of a magical, mystical expression. It is somewhat odd because we see in Acts of the Apostles when Peter evangelizes the pagan household of Cornelius. They're absolutely pagans, but we know that something happens after Paul, Peter preaches to this household of Roman pagans that they have, quote, been evangelized. And how does he know that? That the gifts of the Spirit, they speak in tongues. Whatever it is, Peter says, because he goes, that's in chapter 10. In chapter 11, he goes to Jerusalem and says to James and to John, you wouldn't believe what happened. I was in the home of these pagans. I preached Jesus Christ, dead and resurrected. And the Spirit descended upon the pagans. How do you know that, Peter? Because they began to speak in what is called glossolalia. They began to speak in tongues. A certain guarantor that the Spirit has been called over the assembly by the miracle of his effective preaching. Once that happens, there's no, no, no one goes to Cornelius and his family and his slaves and all his household and gives them an RCIA quiz. Do you, do you know, can you spit back for me now what Peter said in his homily? All it takes is the evidence of the Spirit descending on them convinces them, oh my gosh, that even Gentiles can be evangelized. So it's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's what, what we have in the accounts that is important in the early church to confirm, oh, you got it, and I know you got it, because the Spirit has manifested himself, herself, within the assembly. Then it must have taken, it must have worked. So, it is not, and then, and then Paul, a good Pharisee, has to think, process this in his head as a good Pharisee would. And he starts to think of his own understanding of the history of Judaism, which he knows inside and out. This will come up later in Galatians. And he remembers that in Genesis chapter 15, God has made a promise to Abraham. God says to Abraham, Abraham, go outside, look at the stars of the sky, and count them if you can. Consider the sands of the seashore, and count them if you can. Just as numerous will be your descendants. And it says, Abraham believed, and it made him righteous before God. Ergo, and Paul took my intro to Old Testament course at the seminary, so he knows that the Exodus, the covenant, the agreement with Moses happened around 1250 BC. The rules of Torah came to Moses from Mount Sinai in 1250 BC. Abraham precedes that by 450 years. There is no Torah yet. And Paul has the aha, or lateness, as the Germans call it, and realizes it cannot be Torah that justifies, because Abraham was justified 400 years before there was a Torah, and the text of Genesis 16 says, 15 says, oh, he believed, and his belief made him righteous. Aha, it is faith. And who is the descendant of Abraham? We'll find out in Galatians. It is Jesus Christ. As Abraham believed, and it made him righteous. So now your belief in Jesus Christ will make you righteous before God. Therefore, not only the works of the law will not make you righteous, you cannot slip backwards in time. Because with the coming of Christ, that's all different now. We needed the law. We needed the Torah. We need all those 613 rules to keep us well behaved and to keep us right with God until the Jesus event Jesus' life, death, and resurrection now abrogates all of that, and it is faith in Jesus and the gospel that will make you right before God. And what the Galatians are doing is they're abandoning that understanding of the gospel that Paul preached to them, and someone has convinced them 
you know, actually, you really do have to obey the, the, all the rules of Torah. And he says, you, you're slipping back. And it, it's, you can't do that. It will not help you. It will not make you righteous. And the issue, of course, will be for accepting Torah, the men must submit to circumcision. And Paul says, if you've done that, then you've signed a new contract. Now you have to do all of the works of Torah because you agreed to it. And you've undermined your righteousness before Jesus because you dispensed with faith in him and put your faith in the works of the law, and now you're committed to doing it. Okay? So, uh, yes? So, in one sense, you're, you're saying the 613 rules of Torah. How does that, uh, how do you balance that with, yes, you must keep my commandments, meaning the Ten Commandments? In other words, even Christ says, you know, I've come to fulfill the law. He, he actually struck. Says, However, he only says that in Matthew, by the way. He does not say that in Luke or in John or in uh, Mark. He that is in Matthew. Okay. But the, the, the commandment, he, he actually instructs, keep my commandments. My commandments, not the Torah commandments. I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That is, to perfect it. Now, he doesn't say, I perfect it by making you obey the 613. I fulfill them because the prophets from the beginning of time have prepared the way for me. I now, in my gospel, replace the Torah. Now, but that is a problem because Matthew's gospel says, and only there does Jesus say, not a jot or tittle of the law will be done away with until, but the assumption is the until has happened. In Jesus' death and resurrection, the until now has happened, so that old law no longer applies. It, it's the logical question. Most people who under, saw, were contemporaries of Jesus would have seen him as a generally Torah-observant Jew. And to say, I want to follow him, and then someone tells me, oh, you, you can follow him, but you don't have to do what he generally did in order to follow him. That does seem like the odd interpretation, but that is the interpretation of Paul. James, initially, certainly, and the earliest leadership of the church, expect, just it was a given that you would have to be Jewish to follow Jesus. Peter, in chapter 10 and 11 of Acts, introduces the possibility of OMG. You mean you can follow Jesus and not be a Jew? And Paul will pick that up in the rest of Acts and, in fact, go in the direction that the church would do, which is to follow Paul's teaching, not only not requiring Torah, but eventually, by the 4th century, declaring it is heretical to require Torah for Christian conversion. How does, so, I mean, this is the problem. So how does Paul explain himself? Uh, I'm going to have to come back to this again later, but very clearly, in almost all of the seven undisputed letters, Paul will appeal to his authority as what? How dare you preach this, Paul? Who the heck are you? And Paul's first answer is, I am an apostle. I'm an apostle like James, I'm an apostle like John, I'm an apostle like all of the rest of them. That is a, his appeal to authority. What makes him an apostle? Three requirements. You must have seen the Lord that has been with him in his life and ministry. You must, too, have suffered for the gospel. And three, you must have established Christian com communities by your preaching of that gospel. And Paul will say, I have done all three. But of course, someone will say, well, 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 wait a minute, Paul. No, not quite. You really weren't there when Jesus was doing this and that. You didn't really accompany him. And Paul will say, but I did see the Lord on the road to Damascus. And he will explain, I am an apostle 
but I am one who is born an apostle out of the normal course, not the normal way that they became an apostle, but I am an apostle, I am an apostle, I am an apostle. Just bear with me for a moment. In the opening of Galatians, so the, the Greek is very succinct. Paulos, so Paul. Apostolos, an apostle. Uk ap anthropu, not from a human being. Ude di anthropu, or by means of a human being. Of a human being. Allah, but dia Christu Jesu, but by Jesus Christ. Kai and Theopatros and God the Father. I am made an apostle not by you people, but by God Himself and Jesus Christ Himself. I am an apostle. And therefore, my version of the gospel is legitimate. He will also say, and we know this to be true from Acts as well, and my version of the gospel was approved by James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, when I went up to meet him with Peter. They approved this gospel that I preach. I hope you remember I, I said this is the issue that overarches the first two centuries of the church. What do we do about Gentiles? Can we, must we require that they first become Jews to some extent, that is, observe some of Torah, or not impose that on them at all. So in Acts 11, when Peter has had this incident with Cornelius and his household of pagan babies in Caesarea Maritima, it says in the beginning of chapter 11 that he is summoned, summoned to Jerusalem. Remember I talked about Emily Latella, the old Saturday Night Live character. What's all this I hear about? There is a sense of that in the opening of chapter 11 that the, the, the Jewish Christian leadership in Jerusalem is saying, what have we been hearing about you, Peter? What's going on here? So, just give me a minute. So in Acts, Now, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea, Judea is the southern part, says Maritima is the farther northern end of Israel, which is where Cornelius was. The apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, Jewish Christians, leaders of the church, criticized him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and, and what does he do when he's up there? He baptizes all of them. But that's not what they're complaining about. What do they say? You have gone up to the uncircumcised men and eaten with them, forbidden by Jewish Torah observance. An Orthodox Jew cannot eat with pagans. It makes him unclean, ritually impure. I don't want to snitch on him, but I want to say, excuse me, James, he baptized them. They don't seem to care about that. Why? Because that's not in the Torah. The Torah says you can't eat with them. They're tied up with that issue still. And at the end of this long discourse, they will come to the conclusion, the leaders of the church at the end of verse 18 of chapter 11, then God has given to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. James will instruct at the end of this incident, you know, somebody get a, a pad of paper and a pen, take down this letter. And he says, send this letter to all the believers and tell them, we require four things of Gentile converts. I, we talked about this before. No meat offered to idols. New pagan Christians, you cannot go to the pagan temples anymore where they're sacrificing cows and sheep and goats and all that, and the faithful would eat the meat of the butchered animals. James says, from now on, you can't do that. No meat with blood in it. This is against the Torah. You cannot eat 
or consume blood in any way, shape, or form. You're not even supposed to touch blood, much less eat it. Similarly, you cannot eat meat from any animal that is strangled because the Torah has a very specific description of how you must slaughter an animal for it to be ritually pure for consumption. That is, you must slice the throat in a very particular way, etc. And then you must marry only within Jewish consanguinity rules. So this is you cannot marry your first or second cousin, you can only marry as far down as your third. This is what Acts says James decides after his meeting with Peter, send this letter to all the churches. And in Acts, they all agree, thank you, we've resolved the problem, wonderful. But in Galatians, we'll see, Paul talks exactly about this incident, and he says, I agreed to no requirements of of kosher or Torah observance whatsoever, nothing whatsoever. They didn't require it, and I didn't agree to anything, completely denying this version of that meeting. Why the two versions are different is is another four-part series. (laughs) Remember, Acts is written almost 60 years later. Paul is written about 20 years later. Paul is a contemporary of the meeting. Acts is not. I think someone's PR agency got in there and said, we've got to make it look like they played nicer than they did. As we'll see in Galatians, Paul is angry at Peter about this incident and similar incidents, and he will call him names in this letter. He's very angry in Galatians. Okay? So the issue turns on how are you made righteous with God? The Jewish notion is you're made righteous by Torah observance. Paul's notion is no, you are made righteous by your faith in Jesus Christ. And I can demonstrate that theologically by his talking about the history of Abraham being made righteous 400 years before Torah even exists. This is the recurring motif of Paul's whole career. Remember, he he will say in Galatians and in Romans, he will repeat it, that he has been dogged after he works and evangelizes pagans. The the Judaizers will follow him and undermine him to his converts after he leaves their town. So he goes to Galatia and evangelizes for two years and leaves, and after he leaves, he finds out someone sends him a letter. Paul, after he left, a bunch of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came and they told us you preached the wrong gospel. They told us we have to become Jews and take on Torah observance in order to follow Jesus Christ. You didn't tell us that. That is what prompts Galatians. What? That's the reaction. He says in the letter at the Thanksgiving part, Paul, called to be an apostle, not by human beings, but in the grace and peace to you. He's supposed to now say, I always thank God for your wonderful Galatians. And he says, Thaumazo, I am shocked at you, Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Yes. So Paul's like an interrupter. In other words, like, is, does anybody of authority, when I'm saying that, like James and Peter, are there other people of that level of authority that's following Paul, or is he out there all by himself? All by himself. Mm. All by himself. In fact, he probably dies, this is my guess, I think he dies thinking he's not succeeded at all. If we believe what he says in Romans, that he wishes to go to Spain to start a new missionary effort, Why does he go to Spain? Because no one can undermine his gospel in Spain because no one's preached any version of the gospel in Spain. And he says so. That's why I want to go there because I've had it with these dogging, you know, people at my heels at every turn. I want to go someplace where no one has preached Jesus at all. I'll do that in Spain. Now, a great Pauline scholar, Joe Murphy O'Connor, an Irish Dominican, can't help being a Dominican, he says that Paul makes it to Spain 
and has no success whatsoever. There is no evidence that Paul in any way made any inroads in converting those Iberian people to Christianity and that he repairs to Rome after five or six years of effort in Spain, considering his effort as a missionary at Colossal failure. And then is caught up in the persecution of Nero and probably killed around the year 64. So I think at his lifetime, it probably looked like he was moribund. This is not going to work. We know it did because by the year 90, when Acts of the Apostles is written, Paul is accepted by the author of Acts as a fait accompli. Of course he was right. Doesn't even question. Acts of the Apostles never questions whether Paul had the authority of an apostle. It's a given, according to this author, by somewhere around the year 90, it's a given. Which says, oh, at least among some Christians, Paul absolutely succeeded. Let me add just another note here. So we think of Christianity in this Pauline version, that it is without Torah observance. If you like bacon cheeseburgers, you like Paul, right? Because you can't eat cheese, you can't mix dairy, you can't eat pork, you know. And Paul's version won the day. But we know that up until 700 AD, there remained a group of heretical Christians called Ebionites, remember my mentioning this? Who still believed that you had to follow the Torah in order to be a Christian. Until 700 AD. So the idea that suddenly Torah observance stops and non-Torah becomes the norm is not an accurate depiction of the history, of the difficult history that this went through. It would take a long time. Now by the year 300, it is considered heretical to teach this, but there was a group of heretical Christians who continued to teach it for 400 years after it was named a heresy. So it didn't just turn off and on. It took a long time. And, of course, the demography is probably as much a reason for its success as anything else. More and more Gentiles were becoming Christians, for whom Torah observance just didn't make any sense to them, for whatever reason. I don't care whether Jesus did or not. I like pork chops. It just, just doesn't make any sense to them. Pagan cults also had dietary rules. But they were not unyielding, and they were not so absolutely gene generic as no pork whatsoever, no blood whatsoever, clean, ritually clean meat, cannot come into contact with ritually unclean meat. If you uh, are unclean and you're making dinner, the dinner you make is unclean, and everyone who eats it becomes unclean, and anyone who, pardon me, ma'am, skin to skin contact, anyone who touches you now gets your, to the, to the Gentiles, it's like, what? That's ridiculous. It's absurd. Given that their number grew so very quickly, the argument was much easier to make. And very quickly, Jewish leadership of the movement is dying out. The push is now to the Gentile-dominated population of the church. And I think I'm not exactly where or how this plays into, but I know it had to play a role. The shift of leadership, the locus of leadership, moves from Jerusalem to Rome. Well, believe me, Jews in Rome are the minority. The majority in Rome are pagans, for whom a non-Torah gospel is very much more attractive than telling me I have to do all these Torah things in order to follow Christ. And don't forget, 49 AD, all Jews are kicked out of Rome. The only Christians left in Rome are not Jewish Christians anymore. They're only Gentile Christians until five years later when some Jewish Christians return. Yes, sir? Um, I'm wondering if uh, the Jewish converts to Christianity, if they maintain their Jewish tradition, was that a problem? If they still the Torah. I mean, that doesn't mean they were making the Gentiles do it, but if they did it, yes. that was that okay? It was, no, they did it and it was a problem. It wasn't. And, and what, what's the flashpoint of the problem? What would raise this problem? The weekly celebration of the Eucharist. 
if you're in a Christian community that includes both Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, and the central cult of the movement, which was a weekly meal on Sunday, very we know it was on Sunday already during the time of Paul, and it was a covered dish kind of meal, it wasn't the ritual meal we have now as the Mass, people brought food to distribute to all the members of the community, especially the poor, you brought your excess food on Sunday morning, well, you're bringing your filter fish and bagels, but she's bringing pork chops and sauerkraut. You find that offensive, Mrs. Goldberg. <coughs> this is a recurring problem. It was a constant source of irritation. So the heavy knife were still Jews. Yes, they actually spun off into all kinds of weirder heresies in those 700 years, but they saw themselves as Torah observant Jews who followed Jesus. They would become a Gnostic sect, actually. But what made them who they were to begin with was their uh, uh, their conviction that you had to follow Torah in order to follow Christ. What about Messianic Jews today? That's a Protestant sect more than it is Jewish. Yeah. There, there are there are. <laughs> if you've ever been to Israel, you do hear of Rabbi Schneerson. His posters all over the old city of Jerusalem. There is a sect of Messianic Judaism in Israel who are truly Jewish, but they believe the Messiah is not Jesus. Their Messiah is a, a Lithuanian <coughs> rabbi named Rabbi Schneerson, who died in Brooklyn in the 1970s, at whose grave they still post watchers because they're expecting his resurrection. So they are Messianic Jews, and they are truly Jews, and it is their idea of the Messiah is not Jesus, but that he came in the person of this rabbi. It's a, they, these are the Lebevacher Jews. I don't know if they have congregations in Baltimore. They're very prominent in Florida, lots of Lebevacher synagogues. But in America, when we hear of Messianic Jews, that's really kind of a Protestant movement. But they still maintain Jewish traditions. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I can't imagine how they could do that and square that with the New Testament, where clearly they're not following Torah anymore within the New Testament. So they don't. So they don't see Jesus as a fulfillment, but they could still do it. You know what I mean? I believe that they believe Jesus was the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. But in Jesus' own example and preaching, you don't have to continue to follow Torah. This is uh, kind of background stuff, but it's background that I think is necessary for us to understand what's going to happen in Galatians. All right? Now, Paul's churches and Paul's authority, uh, so he establishes churches. How do his churches organize themselves as aggregations of human beings? They have to have some kind of order, principle of some kind. In Paul's communities, authority is not given by Paul. Authority is given by the manifestation of the Spirit. So the Spirit gives gifts to the church community the gift of teaching, the gift of prophecy, the gift of oversight, etc., and that determines the authority structure of his communities. In John's communities, we'll find out what gives authority is how close were you to the beloved disciple. So the beloved disciple is the key authority figure. He was the closest person to Jesus. Therefore, he has authority. Before he dies, he has a disciple with whom he is particularly close and teaches that man becomes his heir, and then the next one becomes his heir, etc. In the other communities, we believe the authority structure would develop, develop into what we pretty much have today, priest, uh, bishop, priest, and deacon, so that we see in the pastoral letters of Timothy and Titus a church that reflects that three-part hierarchical structure. Paul's communities didn't have that. Paul's communities you are the leader because the Spirit has given you a gift 
to do X, Y, or Z. That means you're in charge of X, Y, and Z. The, gift, the Spirit gave you the gifts of A, B, and C, so you're in charge of A, B, and C. So it's, it's known as a charismatic authority, the gifts of the Spirit. Right. So, living under the Spirit in the Pauline communities, that is how you maintain your right relationship with God and with one another. You live in conformity to the Spirit of Jesus that you got by your faith in Him and eventually in your baptism into His death. If you start picking away at this fundamentum, this primary issue, by drumming on all these other things, you're going to undermine the very foundation of your salvation in Jesus Christ. You start adding, well, now you have to add the litany to it. You've got to go to benediction twice a week, and then you've got to wear a scapular, and you've got to wear a Franciscan habit. It has to have three knots, not four. You start adding this stuff onto it, you're undermining the very thing that has saved you. So Paul is, is adamant. Okay, so you just want to do a little bit of the Torah, and you want to do a little bit more of the Torah, you want to do little... Paul said, no, 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 you cannot do any of that. You cannot let any of this in because it will start to undermine the very core of the gospel. And he says, by the way, when I preach the gospel to you, did the Spirit show itself because you were following the Torah? No, the Spirit showed itself because when I preached the gospel, you believed it. That's how the Spirit manifested itself among you, Galatians. You weren't doing Torah. That didn't bring the Spirit. It was your belief in the preaching that I did of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, remember I, I, I said before, Paul's theology emerges. This is a perfect example of that. I, unless the Galatians had written to him about problems, we don't know what Paul would have thought about Torah observance. But because it became a problem for the Galatians, and someone in Galatia wrote him a letter apparently saying, uh, Paul and I were confused, because a bunch of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, that's like the central office, they've come and they said, we're not doing this right. This forces Paul to think about it. Because this is now front and center on his radar screen, he is forced to deal with this and sit down and contemplate, now wait a minute, how am I going to explain this to them? And then it's like, oh my God, how could they have completely missed the boat like this? If I'm going to go to Rome, I better be very careful about how I explain this issue to them, because if the Galatians got this all wrong, God knows what rumors they've heard about me in Rome. Which is why I maintain that Galatians is a practice run. It's a draft of what would become a much more uh, complex letter that he will write later to the Romans where he deals with the same issues. This is the first draft, if you will, that forces Paul, how do I really think about these issues? Ah, I got it. He sends it to the Galatians. Then later when he writes the Romans, he draws and develops those ideas that are just minutely present in Galatians. He will expand them greatly in the letter to the Romans. <clears throat> yes? So maybe I'll steal a little over here. In, the, in Galatians, do we hear Paul talk about freedom as much as he talks about it in Romans? And does that, is that a, because Paul defines what freedom is in Romans, right? He does. Freedom is one of the, Romans is one of the most cited works by the founders of our own country. Absolutely. Like they, they all looked at Romans as being a founding document for themselves. Right. Um, so I was anticipating, because if you're talking about Galatians, it seems to be setting up this problem of, okay, well, looks like there are no rules. So you kind of go, Paul's kind of, it's a very amorphous, it's not a without limits kind of society that just, Paul, being, if he is a Roman, he would know that it's not going to work. That is apparent more than real. It appears to be the case that, and Paul will address this briefly in Galatians, but primarily in Romans, since you brought it up. <laughs> so how does he do that? You now, in your dying and rising with Jesus in your baptism, 
you have joined yourself into in Christ. In so doing, we see this in 1 Thessalonians, you have joined yourself with every other baptized Christian who has similarly died with Christ and also got inside Christ. So in, in, the, the, in the tunic. So this is Christ that I am now inside of. You're inside the same Christ. So he was saying 1 Thessalonians, you think that because someone has died before the second coming of Christ, that you are somehow separated from them. No, no, you're not. Why? Because you are both still in Christ. Was your grandma baptized before she died? Great. Were you baptized? Yes. Well, then you're still in Christ. Her separation from you is not real. It looks as though she is, but she is still in Christ as you are still in Christ. Death cannot remove you or her from being inside the same body of Christ. You really have to wrap your head around this because then he goes on and makes ethical implications about how you must behave. Because you are now in Christ, I'll say you, you can take that body that is in Christ to a brothel. Because you're in Christ. You're taking Christ to this place. You can't mistreat your brother or sister because you are sharing the same substance and the same being. You are all in Christ. You can't misbehave because you are scandalizing your fellow believers who are with you in Christ. It becomes the basis for his ethical teaching. It isn't a free-for-all. It, it has been interpreted that way, and Paul knows that some are interpreting it that way. Well, you know, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war and do whatever the hell we please, you know. Gaudiamus um, tour, you know. Uh, he said, no, 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 you're not free that way. You are in Christ, and that obligations come with your being baptized into his death and resurrection and putting on Christ, to whom you now belong, along with your fellow brothers and sisters. He speaks of this in 1 Corinthians. One of the four rules that James says in Acts is you cannot eat meat that is offered to idols. Someone in Corinth has seen a fellow Christian participating in a pagan sacrifice. Remember, this is how the poor got meat. You went to pagan sacrifices, that was the source of protein, of meat protein in your diet, because otherwise all you ate was oatmeal all the time. Someone saw someone eating meat that had been offered to a pagan idol and wrote to Paul and says, Whoa, I saw Mrs. Cunningham yesterday. Uh, she was having pork chops at the, you know, at the Apollo temple. And Paul has to think about this. And he says in 1 Corinthians, well, in fact, we know there really are no other gods. They think they offered that cow to a divinity called Apollo, but we know there's no such thing. So in fact, it wasn't really offered to a god, but it looked like that. And because we are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, we are no longer bound by such rules. We have the freedom of the children of, and sons of God. But Mrs. Cunningham's faith is stronger than Mrs. O'Leary's, who saw her do this. Mrs. Cunningham's behavior by eating that meat became a source of scandal to Mrs. O'Leary, whose faith is weaker. And therefore, it is a source of scandal and out of charity for your brother and sister. Don't do that. So it's, he, knew, he understands freedom in a very particular way, but it is not a laissez-faire freedom, as he knows is being interpreted by some of his Gentile converts. And he is at pains to say, the freedom you enjoy by dying and rising with Christ is not without ethics. On the contrary, because you are now in Christ with your fellow brothers and sisters, you have requirements of ethical behavior to behave as though you are in Christ. So, the communion of saints will come out of this teaching in 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, where Paul says, we are all, you know, what the nuns used to call the church militant, the church triumphant, and then they had the church bazaar. No. <laughs> so you have, the, you have the church militant, and then you have those who have already died, they are triumphant, and then the church that's suffering, you are all one church. You are all in Christ. 
your battle is over. You're in heaven. We're still struggling, and then there are those still in purgatory suffering. That teaching of the communion of saints comes from Paul's ethics about being baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. So you're not separated from your dead loved ones as it appears you are, because you are still both in Christ, which is the basis for so much of our understanding of, of after death as Roman Catholics. That comes right from Paul. And that comes from Paul's notion of baptism. Okay. <clears throat> so Galatians will deal with these questions. What is the relationship between Christianity and Judaism? I would, I'm not even sure that if I met Paul as he was writing this letter, I wonder what he would say if I said, would say, Paul, are you are you like a Christian? I, I don't know if he would understand that term even. And would he understand it? He would have to understand it somehow as distinguishing him from Jew, I guess. But it is this this letter deals is the first one to deal with these big issues. One of the issues that comes up in chapter 6 of Galatians that Paul has apparently had to deal with elsewhere before, and that is, what is the relationship of God now with Israel? If the law no longer counts, and we are free of it, you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian, then what of the history that we know God has with the Jews? Is that all erased? Paul will say, no, it's not. But it is an issue that he will have to deal with to explain to pagans who know something about Judaism, well, God has not abandoned his covenant with the Jews, but it's been redefined in terms of the new Israel, which are those who follow Jesus Christ. This is a problem in Luke Acts. So apparently it was a problem beyond just Paul. Many Gentiles must have raised this issue how can we trust this God of yours? By the way, you say there's only one. How can we trust this God of yours if he's abandoned the Jews? Why will he not abandon us? And so Paul has to deal with this. In any event, not only has it come to light for Paul that his gospel has been undermined in Galatia, in the communities of Galatia, but that it's already started. The, the, the reading of Galatians by most exegetes suggests that it isn't that they are tempted to give up on Paul's gospel and become Jews. They are already starting to become Jews. Males have already been submitted to circumcision before Paul writes the letter to them. So this is underway. It isn't a threat. It seems a couple of places in the letter, it, it sounds as though uh, this is urgent, Paul. This has already begun to happen. It isn't that they're talking about doing it. Many are already doing it. So he is anxious that he make himself very clear. He will say, well, oh, we'll come back to that. So this is a part that I think is very important, that hits at the core of what most of the letter will be about. And these are these two texts from chapter 5 and chapter 6. Paul says, listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. That suggests that someone who is undermining Paul's gospel to the Galatians is suggesting, well, Bob, uh, you go ahead and submit to circumcision, see the doctor, and after you're all healed and stuff, um, then uh, you don't have to avoid pork anymore, though. You could do that. That whoever these Judaizers are, they're telling them, well, you, you have to be circumcised, and you have to kind of generally accept the Torah observance. Oh, but maybe not that one, and maybe not that one. Now, it's not clear. Paul doesn't say this outright, but the way he responds in chapter 5 and 6 makes it sound like whoever is undermining his gospel is not telling them the full truth. That circumcision requires full acceptance and obedience to Torah. You cannot pick and choose which obligations of Torah you're going to follow after you've been circumcised. 
Now, at the end of the letter, chapter 6, <clears throat> this, is, this is curious. So we know that Paul 